Welcome to episode three of the Farming Biogas Podcast on realagriculture.com. I'm your host, Sean Haney of Real Agriculture and Real Ag Radio on Rural Radio 147. We've learned so much through this podcast series about biogas operations, systems, and, and the why of it. And we're going to do the same thing here today. On-farm biogas systems use anaerobic digestion to recycle livestock manure and crop residue. This process produces biogas, which creates environmental and business opportunities for the farm. Anaerobic digestion creates a renewable source of energy that can be used on farm or sold to utilities to diversify a farm's income. A lot of benefits. Today's guest on the Farming Biogas podcast is Corb Whale. He farms in Drayton, Ontario. Here's my conversation with Corb Whale. Corb, how are you doing today? I'm well, thanks. How about you? Hey, fantastic, man. Corb, why did you get started in biogas on your farm? I'll tell you, it started many years ago. I graduated from McMaster University in civil engineering and had the chance to do a few projects at school about anaerobic digestion. And then met one of my mentors, Richard Waybright, from Mason Dixon Farms in Pennsylvania. And he'd been operating an anaerobic digester for about 20 years at that point. And so between the projects and seeing his farm, to me, my, my mind started spinning at the possibilities. So that's that's how I found anaerobic digestion and, of course, how I got passionate about it. Yeah, and so I'm looking forward to hearing more about your system and how you, you measure and some of the benefits and things like that. How do you on your farm produce biogas? So we have a fairly standard system. We, we toured a bunch of systems around the U.S. and Europe before we built ours. And there weren't any commercially available systems in North America at the time. So we bastardized a bunch of different systems and put them together, basically. So we have a a fairly simplistic operation. We have 2,000 cubic meter anaerobic digesters. Um, We have a mix tank, a receiving tank. We make sure we take all of the manure from our farm into the mix tank. We mix that with off-farm waste in that same mix tank and feed the digesters every hour. The digesters both operate as primary digesters, so we feed them both equally, and we collect the gas under a dome, which is fed back through a generator. What are you using for feedstocks? Uh, About half of what we put in is produced on the farm. Most of it's manure. There is some waste feed, and the other half is sourced off-farm, so typically from food processing industries, um, slaughterhouses, places like that. So that amounts to about 8,000, 9,000 tons a year. What size is the anaerobic digester that you have, and and how many animals support the size of that system? Uh, We milk 150 cows, so on farm there are about 300, 350 altogether. So interestingly, only a fraction of our gas is produced from the manure and feed on the farm. The bulk of the gas is actually produced from the waste that we bring onto the farm. So in terms of size, it depends how you measure. So I've got two ways of measuring. One, the size of my reactors. So each is a million liters or a thousand cubic meters. And the second is we measure output in kilowatts because that's our uh, um, that, that that's our measurable is electricity kilowatts. So we have a 250 kilowatt contract with Hydro One. So... Give us some context, like in, in terms of sizes and possible sizes, where, where do you kind of fit on that pendulum? Do you consider yourself a small, medium, large producer then? Like, how do you look at that? Uh, we're relatively small. There are definitely much smaller, but uh, so just to give you some context, we use about a fifth of the energy we produce to power our farm. So by producing 250 kilowatts continuously, we could power five farms our size. That gives you an idea, or 40 to 50 homes a year. Um, in Ontario, uh, biogas operations range from 10 kilowatts all the way up to 2,000 kilowatts. So there's, you can see at, at 250, we're at the low end, but we're on the industrial side of sizing. So once you get below 250, it becomes a little more, um, a little more niche, and above 250 is more industrial. 
You described your system as you know rather standard, but is there anything that makes your system unique when you when you describe it? That's an interesting question. I think they're all unique in their own way. The biggest difference of mine compared to others is that we did do it ourselves. We've got lots of different technologies incorporated into the same one. I did not want a solid feeder on my system. A lot of people are are adding their solids with a solid feeder. We try to homogenize everything into a pumpable liquid before it goes into the digester. To me, that was uh, a lot less moving parts and a lot easier. And I think the the main ingredient in making our digester was something that was relatively straightforward, fairly simple to source parts and and equipment for, and uh, we wanted to be able to maintain it ourselves. So those were the those were what we were looking for when we designed it and built it. So you mentioned that some of the energy is used to power your farm, and some goes back into the grid. What is that? What does that look like? Is that a long-term contract on the grid, or is that like a spot market on a basically what it is for the month? How does that How does that work? Yeah, we were lucky in Ontario. The McGuinty government saw the value of green energy, and they created the Green Energy Act. So we had a predictable contract. Without that contract, I don't think we would have receive financing from any banks. It was too risky a venture for banks at that point. So we do have a 20-year contract. For us, it started in uh, 2012. Um, so 20 years at a fixed rate with uh, an escalator based on, on COP. So that was the basis for getting anything started. On our farm, we do use some of the electricity. We use a portion of the heat that we make we use the fertilizer that comes at the back end and we use the solids as bedding. So we are using many of the the fringe aspects of a digester mm-hmm. on the farm. Yeah, and you know, the everybody I think thinks of the revenue first, right? That's the that's the first thing that comes to mind, but th- there is a lot of other benefits and you kind of mentioned a few of them there, but th- there's a lot of other benefits that come out of these systems. Yeah, absolutely. And and it's hard to measure those. So when you're putting together your business plan, it really is hard to measure those because you don't it's it, you don't really quantify those easily. So the business plan truly is based on the marketables, which in our case is electricity and fertilizer, but the rest of it adds a lot to your farm. So one that we always knew would be an asset but it was hard to measure was the fertilizer value. So we've always managed our nutrient really well and really closely on this farm. We haven't bought commercial fertilizer for 25, almost 30 years now, but the, the fertilizer value of the digestate is so much higher. And we had heard anecdotally that it was higher, but it's hard to ever put that down in a business plan. So by about year three of applying our digestate to the field, we started to realize almost a 15% increase in crop yield. And we measured that um, using, we, it, we have custom operators that do our, our combining and harvesting for us. So we're measuring that based on our peers. It's not, it's not just anecdotal. It's actually measured. So that is one that that we're really happy about. But when we were preparing for it, we didn't know how to how to account that. So what sort of environmental benefits has your farm achieved by producing biogas on the farm? Um, there's, I think there's a lot. Uh, and again, there, there there's a lot of intangibles to that as well. So the first. My goal all, always in building one of these was to become sustainable. I, I think I think sustainable is a buzzword these days, but 10, 15 years ago when we were planning this, sustainability was more of a concept than it was a, a buzzword. So for us, I wanted to be able to produce as much as I could on our farm without having to buy things in and obviously not waste anything that we did have on the farm. So I love the idea that my cows produce the manure that powers the digester that feeds the crops that feeds the cows so we've closed that loop i also love the fact that in that process while we're making electricity the byproduct is heat which i can use to heat water in the barns to heat my houses to um we we actually have it in pads as, as ice melting systems as well just to dissipate the heat so that's a nice closed loop the another byproduct from the digester is bedding by pressing out the liquids we've got this really nice peat moss like material that we can use in the barn as bedding so that whole sustainability piece i think is great so that's number one 
Number two, the University of Guelph did a bunch of research here. They, they had some monitoring towers up around our manure pit before construction, during construction, and then for a few years after we started operating the anaerobic digester. And we're able to take out in 90 to 97 percent of all greenhouse gases um, from our storage pit by digesting what we brought on farm. And that's 90 to 97 percent versus uh, straight manure. What that didn't actually take into account was that at that point we were bringing in 8,000 tons of off-farm material. So we're also taking the greenhouse gases out of that that formerly went to landfill. So I think that's really important. We're displacing we're displacing a lot of uh, greenhouse gases with an anaerobic digester. And I think then the third thing is, and my ultimate goal, will be to use the gas to create uh, vehicle fuel. And if we can do that, I think we can actually become a carbon neutral or a carbon negative farm. So that's the long-term goal for us. We're not there yet, but hopefully in the next few years. How difficult is it to run the system? Like, do, I, like, do you need a degree in biochemistry or is this something that is rather turnkey and easy to operate? Uh, it's going to be halfway in the middle there. <laughs> so, and I think, uh, I think when we all started this, there's a lot of rumors and a bunch of operators from Germany said it was a mere 20 minutes a day to operate a system like this. Uh, I tend to think it's triple to quadruple that depending on how complex your system is. A lot of time is taken receiving waste and cleaning and, and those types of things. And there are a lot of moving parts to a digester. But having said that, it fits very well with a dairy farmer's mentality. I'm sure any livestock producer, quite frankly, we feed it every day. We clean it every day. We've got machines and agitators just like we do for our manure systems and everything else. So all of those things we're familiar with. And if you treat it like an animal, it's alive and it needs to be taken care of, then it treats you well back. If you go into a system like this thinking it's a turnkey operation and the machines will run everything, it's bound to be a bit of a disaster, quite frankly. So you do have to enjoy what you do or it's not going to be a success. It's not one of those things you can just... Uh, turn a blind eye to, and it operates itself. You need a dedicated operator. It's sort of like when somebody installs a, a milking robot, right? If if your assumption is you're never going to enter that barn again, you're sadly mistaken. It, you're right. It's it's just not that way. Uh, yeah, hundred so percent. So I know there's a big range of investment required to get into this industry. Um, can you can you talk about how did you pencil out your investment? Yeah, sure. The, so like I explained before, I, I valued most of the intangibles at zero when we did our business plan. The only thing I marked down as a true revenue source was electricity. That was a contract I had with the government for 20 years. The rest of it, we, uh, we had hopes, but we didn't put any of that into the business plan. So it was really important for us to keep our costs down during construction. So um, my background is in civil engineering, so I was able to, to design and, and manage the project, which saved us a bit of money. We also did a lot of the construction ourselves to save us a bit of money. In hindsight, I think I could do it a little bit differently. I think we could value things a little more reasonably. Um, one example is the off-farm waste. When we put that into our business plan originally, we valued it at $0 per ton. So people would be able to tip uh, material into our digester for nothing. My worry was at the time that if a lot of digesters were built, perhaps off-farm waste would not only be um, uh, uh, $0 per ton, but it may even be a commodity and people pay for it. But we actually provide a really good service for our clients. So not only do we do we take their waste organics and process them into something great and good for the environment, but it, we're very reliable. We can take them Every day of the year, we process them really well, and it looks good on the company to use us. So that that the service has actually given us another revenue stream, which we weren't counting on in the beginning. So my hopes were always that it would be a seven to eight year payback, and I think we're going to be pretty close to achieving that. Awesome. So there's always challenges with everything. Uh, what were some of the challenges you encountered, and how did you overcome them? <laughs> That's a good. That's a good one. There are always challenges to everything. I think the first major challenges with biogas were all in uh, 
in um, rules and permitting and trying to do all of the right thing to get a connection to the grid to meet the municipalities' rules and the provincial rules. So that that was a little overwhelming for for us. It was it was new. <laughs> I was going to say exciting, but exciting is not the right word for trying to trying to meet criteria. So that seems to be streamlined. That's one of the downfalls of being an early adopter is that you pave the way for everybody else. So I think since then, everything has gotten much better. I think the other challenge is, is knowing what to look for. When there are very few out there, there's no one to talk to operationally to find out what we're supposed to be watching for. Um, since, I guess, about two years into building our digester, um, we organized a group of digester operators into a company called Cornerstone. So we get together four times a year and discuss operations. We figure out what everybody is doing and how they're doing it and try, to try to avoid some of those downfalls. We, we hired a biologist on site to sample our digesters. So she comes to all of our digesters twice every month, collects samples, um, gives us results. And we also have our own digesters to benchmark against now to make sure that our levels are normal. We also procure waste together. So, so some of these problems that we had originally, we've found solutions for by working together. And that's really made a big difference for a lot of us. That's cool. That's a great idea. F- finding like-minded people with similar challenges and working together to solve them. That makes a lot of sense to me for uh, sure. Yeah. It, was, it, it has turned out to be really great. And you're right. It, being like-minded helps in so many ways. So all of us were, were early adopters and took the risk. So we all have similar mentalities and, and we're all keen to help each other out. So it, it's, it's been a great, great working relationship. So for producers that are interested in maybe looking at having a system on their farm, what advice can you give them to get started? Um, the, the best advice is just to go see a bunch of them. They're so different in many ways. Uh, so you have to go see a bunch of them See if you can find people who are honest about the the goods and the bads about running a digester. And as long as you go in with your eyes wide open, uh, operating a digester has tons of fringe benefits. Uh, one, one that my kids are really happy to say is that we heat our house with waste heat. So they love to leave the doors open in the middle of the winter. And they just say they, with it, they can because <laughs> the heat's free, Dad. So not, yeah. not that that's a reason to build a digester, but there are fringe benefits to having one. So as long as you go in with, it with your eyes wide open, I think that's the key. Uh, great. Do your, do your research. That, that's, and and far, uh, farmers love visiting other farms, so you get, you'll get a, a farm tour out of it too. So wh- why not? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Hey, Corb, what's the one thing that you learned about biogas that kind of surprised you that maybe you didn't know before you got into this? Hmm. Um, I, I guess if you're looking at it from a distance, uh, biogas is relatively simple. You heat up organics, you stir it, and you collect the gas. So the, the concept is, and there, there's thousands of digesters all across the world in various sizes, and the simplest ones are literally bottles of organics heating and stirring, and you can collect the gas. So the concept seems so easy. What I think I learned is that process is so important. So creating a good process and a bunch of contingency plans for when things go wrong. Because as you know, the more complex a system gets, the harder it is to fix. So the more, the more backup plans you have, the easier it is to get yourself through some of those hard times. So I think that's really what I've learned. So if you're starting from scratch again, what's something you would have done differently? Um, One of the things that we didn't anticipate was how dirty some of the waste would be. And by dirty, I mean it would have chunks of wood in it or plastic or sand, gravel, things like that. And we didn't put a contingency plan to when we're when we're pushing stuff into the digester to take some of those contraries out. Um, We we have managed to find a way, but it is definitely not the most efficient or a pretty way of getting things out. I wish we had a thought of that before we built the digester. Other than that, I wish we had a group of operators that, like we do now. So if I was to build another digester, I would find other like-minded people before I started and ideally plan and build them similarly so that you can, you can have backups for everything 
and shared amongst the group, whether it's backup engines or backup pumps or backup agitators. It's really hard to justify having a backup for every piece of equipment on your farm. But if it was between two or three farms, it would be much easier to handle the financial burden. And you've got that peace of mind that you've got backup. Uh, you know, that's a good final point here. Where, where is the majority of the machinery made and, and how hard is it to get replacement parts? Well, that's just it. When we started, virtually all of it was European. So we brought a lot of European stuff in. Parts ranged anywhere from you know, two weeks to four and a half months. So if you didn't have it and you were down and it was an essential component, you were down for a really long time. Um, we're, we're getting better at uh, either putting things together locally or at least having things sourced locally, whether it's seals or gearboxes. In my situation, all of our pumps were foreign, and now we've got uh, local manufacturers making them for us. And it's different than, than the original, but it works just as well. And if, if, if you stay up, if you stay running, it is definitely worth having those parts local instead of getting something from overseas. Corb, thanks a lot for joining us here today on the Farming Biogas Podcast. My pleasure. It's great being with you. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Farming Biogas Podcast. I want to encourage you, if you want to learn more, go to farmingbiogas.ca. And also, I want to thank our sponsor, Canadian Biogas Association. Thank you so much for bringing awareness of this. I think this is a trend that we're going to see a lot more of. There's going to be a lot of interest in anaerobic digestion. Until next time, thank you so much for joining us here on the Farming Biogas Podcast. I'm Sean Haney of RealAgriculture.com and Real Ag Radio on Rural Radio 147.